Hello there. Thanks for bringing me along on your morning run on the treadmill or your drive home from work or even just into your living room as you kick back and enjoy your retirement with a nice cup of coffee and some good old science education. You're in for a treat this time. I got the chance to catch up with a friend and colleague who studies pain in a very intriguing way by looking at what's going on in the brain while the pain's being experienced. He's an expert in a multitude of brain imaging strategies and he's a fellow kinesiologist, meaning that he studies movement. So put those two things together, throw in a dashing accent to boot, and you get Dr. Steve Coombs. Dr. Coombs is an associate professor in the UF College of Health and Human Performance's Laboratory for Rehabilitative Neuroscience. I hope you enjoy this one as much as I did. And if you do, let us know by hitting that like button and leave a comment or a question or for crying out loud, subscribe to this channel, however you're watching or listening, if you haven't done so already. But first, how about some Ray Lynch? Welcome to The Price of Pain, brought to you by the Pain Research and Intervention Center of Excellence at the University of Florida. Let's join host Dr. Joshua Crow in conversations with scientists, healthcare providers, and industry professionals as we delve into the highly subjective experience of pain and the ongoing effort to reveal its influence on our everyday lives. So, so I've been in Chicago for three years and I did have very clear goals of what I wanted to achieve through that postdoc. And one was basically learning brain imaging, um, was essentially being able to publish in the kind of top brain imaging journals, you know, which if you're not doing brain imaging, you can't do that anyway. Right. But even if you can do brain imaging, being able to publish in that level of journals is, is you know, I had to develop my writing um, and uh, and in addition to the skill set. And then the other thing was grant writing as well. Like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'd seen R01s maybe, but, you know, through other people. And, you know what I mean? It was never like in my area. And how do I write one of these? Right. And how much preliminary data? Do, like, how do you even play that game? Right. So, you know, I got to a point where I'd, I'd, I'd collected, you know, I'd worked on uh, someone else's R01, my mentor's R01. I'd had my F32. And then I basically started putting together an R01 with good mentors and people around me to help me do this. And, you know, in a sense, it didn't, I mean, it mattered if it got funded, but it, that wasn't, the, it, it, it wasn't an idea that I'm going to roll out of here with a funded R01. Right. I just wanted to go through the process with people. And so, so by 2011, um, I'd kind of gotten to that point and then a job opened up here at UF and a job opened up at uh, University of Oregon. And it was kind of, again, we were talking about Colorado. It was one of those things where the West Coast would have been great. But, but you know, I never, when I was here, I never assumed I would be back. It's sort of, a, I don't know where I assumed I was going to be, but it, it wasn't like I was desperate to come back. But it wasn't like I was running away from it either. You know, it, I had a great experience here. And, and so then when, when the job came up, uh, Evangelos Christo had been hired while I was gone mm -hmm. and I knew Evangelos through networking and and you know was I wouldn't say good friends at that point but I knew him well You're enough familiar to, yeah least. familiar with him and and I knew his work and I knew he was doing good things and um and you know there are a couple other things as well one was that there's a med school here and so you have physicians that you can begin to collaborate with very quickly. And, right. and, you know, I guess I need to be careful, but at Oregon, that wasn't an option. It was a great school and mm -hmm. it was a great program. Um, but so the med school was, was a big part of it. Um, and my wife's family are in Florida. Sure. Um, and that's just the reality, right? I yeah. mean, that, yeah. that there are personal decisions that weigh into the professional decisions you make too. So, but it turned out to be a great a great decision. And so you do you you work out of the same lab with David Valancourt. How much do you? Uh, what's the overlap yeah. there between your work and his? So this is another good question. So so I did my postdoc with David, mm -hmm. who is not. Uh, he's felt pain, but he's never studied pain. Uh, but so he's imaging movement disorders, and so basically with him, I learned the brain imaging, um, and a lot of uh, kind of movement in the scanner or basically combining movement with with brain mm -hmm. imaging and so so then i was uh i interviewed in december of 2010 and then was offered the position i guess early 2011 at which point david was still in chicago and so then i had agreed to come kind of signed mm -hmm. and then david came down and gave a talk in 
think March. I remember that talk. Like, I yeah. Did. So I was here. I was up in his <laughs> right. lab in Chicago. And, and uh, again, I. You I mean, know, he's kind of smart. Been, he's you know, is, is somewhat interesting as and, far as his work. Right. And <laughs> and then basically, uh, then UF kind of went after him. Mm -hmm. And so so I we had always sort of agreed the package and space and you know startup all of these things. And mm -hmm. then when it became clear that that they were going after David and that David was open to it. Um, you know, in the end, we ended up basically putting all of my stuff on hold, knowing that David was coming. Otherwise, we're going to set up two mm -hmm. very similar labs equipment wise. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we'd been working together for three years and got on very well. And and we basically said, let's run the lab together. And and so that's kind of how it started. And it was really a it, it's one of those, you know, it's a tough thing when I talk to my students and postdocs now and, you know, how do you get the job and how does it work? And yeah. so much of it is time of luck, almost of timing mm -hmm. of when, when you're ready to get into the market yeah. where the jobs are. And especially, you know, for me in kinesiology, I think for everybody it's the same, but in kinesiology, it's, there's not that many tenure track positions that open up in universities that have MRI scanners for research that have right. med schools for pay. You know what I mean? There's yeah, a there's a specific, of, you, have, you have to check boxes, right? You do. And, and, and there's got to be a line where this is an acceptable amount of open boxes. Still, sure. Right. Yeah, yeah. 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 And so, you know, for, for me, it's worked out very well. I, I think there are, there are definitely people that would rather run a lab on their own, but mm -hmm. I, you know. Well, least, there's got to be some benefits to, to not. Huge benefits. Having to shoulder all of it yourself. Yeah. And I mean, a big part of it is. You know, one thing you don't worry about, I think, when you go doing a PhD and in postdoc is the retention of knowledge. But once you start running a lab, you know, it's 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 a unique environment, I think, at least compared to the corporate world, where you basically train people. They're really, really good. And almost the better they are, the sooner they leave. Right. And then you got to start again. Right. So right. it's this constant sort of cycling. And it's exciting to work with people and teach them as best you can. But but the nice thing about running a lab with someone else is you have kind of double the people. So yeah. the overlap is, is there's just more overlap basically. Mm -hmm. So it's in that sense, it's kind of a little easier to maintain knowledge within the lab. So as you've gone on, um, how, how many years have you, have you both been at APK? 2011. Okay. Oh, so that's yeah. wow. 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 10 that's years, which is so over the course of that time, you said you trained under him mostly for the imaging component. Sure. So you could use that tool and go off and, and follow your own interests. Yeah. But in working together, have there been instances where there's been a bleed through from maybe what he's doing with movement disorders and what you're doing with pain? Um, it's, it's interesting actually. I mean that, you know, the, I think, I think part of it is that that the way that science is maybe set up, or at least NIH is set up, it's kind of silos. So if, if you study Parkinson's, even if Parkinson's patients may have some pain, the assumption is the driving factor is movement. And if we fix the movement, the pain goes away and we're not, you know what I mean? There's almost like a primary focus. And, yeah. you know, I think likewise, uh, people studying pain, the goal is to reduce their pain and I don't want to say less about the movement because it's now coming around, right? That movement turns out to be pretty important. Right. And actually. It's funny you say that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, even if pain does go down, it doesn't mean the movement's going to snap back to what it was right. before the right. pain, right? So, you know, we're kind of learning this. But I guess to answer your question, there haven't really been clean examples of of kind of movement disorders, for example, and pain where we have, a, where we do overlap a lot is in the movement part of right, things. Right. Um, and yeah, I guess another example. So we have, uh, we do uh, heat pain. So we use a thermode and, and we can experimentally control the heat where we have overlapped is actually in uh, mouse models of dystonia. And so in the mouse, the somatic sensory cortex is massive. Um, and there are, uh, there's data on, um, uh, individuals with dystonia basically having altered activation in somatic sensory cortex. And if you could, I'm going to just jump in sure. because we have a, a pretty wide audience. Yeah. Let's, let's fill them in on dystonia. What, a what is dystonia? What are some of the characteristics? How prevalent is it? Just a, a cursory, you know? Sure. So it's a, uh, it's a movement disorder. It's, it's the, probably the, the classic symptom is essentially uh, muscle contraction, like co-contractions. It's almost like spasticity. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, you know, it's interesting in the sense that, that a, uh, almost like a, 
um, a, almost like a locked in contraction, co-contraction that if, if with touch, with just sensory touch, you can break that contraction. Mm. So there's this like sensory component to it that we don't know a lot about. Um, and so this is actually a project that I'm involved in. I'm not, I'm not driving this project where this is partly with, with David and also, um, Yu Ching Li in mm -hmm. neurology. And mm -hmm. so he's basically developed different mouse models of dystonia where this overlaps is that basically we're using the thermode in a magnet. So we're doing, uh, fMRI on the mouse brain while we're basically stimulating the hind paw wow. and then looking at changes in somatic sensory cortex. Basically. So, so how do, how do you, how do you get a thermode because there are metal components of these yeah. inside the scanner? How does that work? So the, so with the company that we have the thermos with, they have kind of outside of the scanner thermos and inside the scanner okay. thermos. And there's a nice price difference <laughs> <laughs> between those, but, but it's great. Cause so we've, uh, we've been basically using that in, in on humans, mm -hmm. um, uh, doing fMRI uh, and looking at essentially regions of the brain that activate when you're engaging pain circuits, right, or the, yeah. the pain processing system. Um, and so the the I guess the transfer across was basically you know in a in the mouse model it's not pain but it's kind of thermal stimulation for right. a better word. So now, do you take it to a level of of nociception where it's a it's a noxious sensation for them i mean you, you can't say that they're you can i i i should retract a little bit i've sure. had guests on that would argue that yeah you there are most certainly indicators of when animals sure. are in pain yeah yeah but it's highly subjective we know sure. that so but do you have reason to believe um or you know are you are you at a point where you could say this is a noxious stimulant this this hurts per se sure i mean so the idea with this project is just to get the somatic sensory cortex to activate less so it really about be, pain, yeah, um, yeah. you know, and so we've gone with lower temperatures mm -hmm. uh, in that, but you know, it's one of these things that, uh, you know, I've talked to Kyle Allen and uh, yeah. you know, that yeah. there are, there's, there's a huge, uh, you know, part of the, the great reason to be at UF. And I'm not sure when, I know Yenisel came after me, mm -hmm. Kyle, I don't know, maybe me and Kyle started similar times, but it takes a few years and you get your kind of sure. lab up and sure. running, but you know, there's, uh, yeah, I mean, there's obviously a big pain group here, right? So yeah. collaboration, I mean, I'm actively working with Unicell and, um, uh, you know, kind of merging these, I guess, different models of pain with the different techniques that we all have. I mean, it's, right. there's a huge amount of things. That That's one of the with. things that, and this is, you know, maybe where Kyle really can come into play at some point. Um, cause we talked a lot on, on his episode yeah. about, how he in in many ways acts as an intermediary and he facilitates people following their interests by sure. designing ways I, as an engineer i think that's phenomenal it's yeah, a really sure. cool way to to uh to make an impact on the research but from you know i'm a kinesiologist as well so a, a lot of my interests there are limitations in what i can do while i because i'm actually following trying to follow a similar path and and, sure. and look more at you know central nervous system contributions to more with with aging individuals, but sure. with age related mobility decline yeah, and functional sure. decline. But you know, when it comes to the scanner, if you really want to know what's going on inside their brain, they should probably be sitting still. Sure, <laughs> sure. So yeah, there yeah. are things. So so to be able to kind of chew away at the edges of of those those limitations and and start to look a little bit closer, I think that's that's fascinating. And I I don't know. Uh, you know, to what extent you've done that, but just the fact that, that people are continually actively trying to say, okay, well, how can we at least get closer to merging these two sure. things? And, and that I think is one of the, the beauties of, of you and, and Dr. Valancourt working, sure. you know, in such close proximity to one another. Yeah, it's, it's definitely been a, a process because you, you know, the classic is you want to study movement and you want to have people lie in a scanner and not move <laughs> while you study movement, right? <laughs> Um, you know, and there's ways around that. So we have people producing isometric force. Mm -hmm. um, and so they can do that. You know, we've done that with uh, uh, jaw pain. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've developed a bite device so people can actually produce uh, force with their jaw. Mm -hmm. And then we've looked at um, uh, people with jaw pain. Uh, with the hand, you know, we have people uh, producing force with the hand. That's what a lot of the, the research on. Mm -hmm. And primarily it's because there isn't an issue with head motion and it's, right. you know, we've been right. running this paradigm for a long time. And, and just so people know, with, with isometric force, there's the joint itself is not moving. So you have muscle Correct. activity, but, but there's not movement. Correct. So. And, you know, you still get really, 
you know, in a, in a nicely controlled paradigm, you get activation of basically the visual motor system sure. pretty beautifully and sort of repeatedly in the brain. And so, so the early work that we did was basically looking at where these systems overlap for want of a better word, and maybe it's simple. I, I don't know if it, it, you know, technically in a sense doing it, it's not simple, but maybe the idea was simple in, you know, a lot of people are studying movement, a lot of people are studying pain, and these two worlds really haven't uh, kind of collided almost. And, yeah. you know, so the early work was basically running the cleanest motor paradigms we could, the cleanest kind of pain paradigms, and then basically looking for where this kind of conjunction or this, mm-hmm. this meets, because maybe that gives us clues on what, how one system is altering the other. So, so that work in a sense was, I don't want to say, uh, it, it was more straightforward because we didn't have to deal with emotion issues. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we did that uh, using MRI. And really, I guess over these last probably four to five years, we, we've gone from basically activating pain circuits, activating motor circuits and figuring out how these may be affecting each other to then as you move almost more clinically when people actually move and the movement itself causes the pain, mm-hmm. right? Rather than we well, have people move and we hit people with pain, but mm-hmm. one is not really tied to the other. Right. And again, clinically, right? It's there's, there's fear before you move. Then there's the pain that can occur or sometimes may get better when you move, right? right? It can go right. both ways. Um, you know, and so there's, in that sense, there were, there's limitations, right? Of every, whichever way you go. Mm-hmm. Um, but so we've, we've been kind of moving more towards trying to uh, image the brain during movement evoked pain. Yeah. And that's, which has kind of brought us up, I guess, to where we are now. And, and that's led us to EEG mm-hmm. more so than fMRI. So we can, you know, there's, there's still motion artifact, but it's nowhere close to, to yeah. what you would. So I, I've, kind of. I've found at least in, in my work that, that there are a lot of labs that work, even even with movement and pain, for example. Sure. Surprisingly, they don't focus on the movement so much at all. So, and and you know, one of my mentors, Adam Woods, would would echo this: is they're, yeah. they're neck up people and they're neck down people. Sure. And there aren't there's still a huge space in between for for you know looking at that. And, sure. And the issues that that I'm at least interested in or interested in trying to address. And it seems yeah. like it's the same with you. And I know it's the same with, uh, with, uh, Yenisel Cruz sure. Almeida, but it kind of, it, it makes me think of back when I was a kid and I, I visited Disney world, right. And they okay. have this phenomenal tour for kids and they take okay. you down in all the tunnels and stuff. Yeah. But one thing they teach you to do is to make an animation. And so okay. you'll draw a little stick figure and they okay. give you a tablet, you know, and, yeah, yeah. and so you just change it a little bit. So when you can, you know, flip all the pages, then, you know, the little stick figure walks. Sure. And it seems like we're at the point in, in movement evoked pain, at least now that where the, the, that particular subset of the field is going is getting much closer to being able to flip those pages because you had alluded to this. We get snapshots. You can get a snapshot sure. of what's going on, even with functional MRI, with fMRI. Yeah. Yeah, there's – you get an idea of what's happening, you know, with brain activity. Yeah. But still, it, it's it's a it's a snapshot. Sure. And the same with isometric pain or with reported pain. But to actually look at it in a continuum of, of what what's the antecedent, what's going on during the pain, sure. what effect does the pain have on movement afterwards. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a really exciting area. It's, you know, it, it, it is, I mean, I, that's, I love it, in a sense. but it, it, you know, it's one of these things that once you start trying to, uh, you have the, the questions that drive it. And then the question is methodologically, how do you get right. this? Right. So right. An, a, an example of that is, is I think you're right that you can have like a single trial. So we have, uh, people, individuals, back pain, chronic back pain, and they're basically making reaching movements, right. And the reaching can basically evoke the pain. It doesn't in everybody, but mm-hmm. in a lot of people, it does. One of the issues is, and it's like I'm basically laying out all the difficulties with trying to do this, but, you know, that's kind of part of the research. But, you know, is you need a a large number of trials to do this, right? So you end up, you know, we're interested in if there's fear before the movement, right? Mm -hmm. If you've got to bend down to a low target versus a high target, um, you know, is there fear before? And do we need to ask the individual, are you feeling fear now? Mm-hmm. And then they're feeling fear and then they move and they say, and how bad was the pain? And so then they give you the rating and then it's like, and repeat 50 times. Right. And so you end up kind of getting back into this, 
you know, you can you can evoke the pain. It, it's almost you want to make it ecologically as valid as you can, but at the same time, you need fifty trials and for the signal to noise. You know what I mean? There's a whole right, host right. of things. So it's so I think we're getting closer. That's for that, sure. I don't um, know about you, but for me, that's that's part of the the more stimulating aspect of this career though, the, the problem solving. It is. I mean, you, know, you want to answer simple. questions, yeah, but yeah. there are the small questions of right. not, not can I answer the question, but how can I Correct. answer the question? And yeah. that's, that's part of the fun, at least now. Yeah, yeah. Now you it know. kind of, it, it, it almost has to be. And, you know, I think, I think questions are really good. I, I don't want to say questions are the easy part, but they kind of, they like, Kind of are, yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, the question is, can Sometimes. you design? Yeah, can you design the? Ex I mean, number one is, does that question matter, or is it? But it can be interesting to you, right? Mm -hmm. It can be interesting to your mm -hmm. students, and you want to figure it out. But, um, but yeah, actually, how how you go about solving that problem, um, I think is that's what you spend most of your time doing, basically. So, with when you worked with Chris Janelle. Uh, mm -hmm. Early on in grad school. Now I know that that at one point he's. I mean, is, is another genius. I, I'm, you know, insanely, sure. uh, insane levels of respect for his work. Sure. Um, but when I first came in, one of his larger focuses, I think he was working with Chris Haas on this, um, but was was kind of movement regulation and emotion, right? Sure. Yeah. Um. Did did you start with that? Is, yeah. Is that really what? So that I mean, so I that's where I started, and that was really the the. Um, I, I guess I was one of his first students. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a guy Chuck Hillman. Do you know I Chuck? Think I know so Chuck Chuck's Hillman. at uh, he was at Maryland, but then I think now he's up in Northeastern. Uh, and anyway, he was doing some EEG with like. Um, think of like exercise but they were using emotion so the mm -hmm. lang lab was here okay. peter lang yep. lang and bradley and they were basically evoking emotions they were using pictures or sounds yeah yeah well then that's that's where i came in and yeah, i, yeah. I kind of want to deviate for just a moment because yeah. it was really neat stuff and so yeah. and i th you know pain is pain is not an emotion but pain is not not an emotion either sure, right so yeah, yeah. Uh, and i'm you know trying to get an idea of you know for this my trajectory yeah your trajectory how, yeah, you know, yeah. this thread how it goes through the tapestry because yeah. this is a, a really rich area um but yeah what i when i came in there was some work on you know showing a picture now it yeah. might be of puppies sure it may be something erotic yeah uh you may be looking down the the barrel of a handgun yeah. from you know a mugger or something sure. like that but the the variables that that the people I was working with at the time, uh, shout out to Brad Fowler and, and yeah, Jessica Brad's Joyner, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kelly Gamble, who is now yeah, yeah. not Kelly Gamble anymore. Yeah. Um, but uh, at the time they were looking at force plate sure. uh, data. So yeah, yeah. you know, did did you did you when you saw this saying it was an aversive image, you know, something right. that you would expect people to retract from? Did they if they were walking toward it and right. this image flashed up on this giant screen? Would they slow down or would they speed up? And that was, I thought sure. it was really fascinating. But to to tie that, I you know, and I, I never really thought about this, but to tie that into the the pain aversion or avoidance aspect um, to movement is, yeah. I think it's really fascinating. So that's so the work that I did through my PhD was basically that similar paradigm, but with really with grip force, mm -hmm. which is what kind of got me reading Valancourt's work. And then basal ganglia would essentially regulate, was one of the areas of the brain that would regulate this force production. Um, and so, uh, so I was doing a lot of that with, uh, I guess, maybe simpler movements. Okay. And then when Kelly and Brad came kind of after me, they took this similar paradigm, started using gait basically, mm -hmm. right? In the force platform. Sure. And that was kind of as I then went off and followed them kind of brain imaging stuff. And even the F32 was emotion and movement. That's when when you were doing that, now you had mentioned um, you, you were looking at EEG. Did you compare that to EMG at all? Were you looking at the, the activity of muscle in, in relation to that or really just focusing on the brain? It was so, so my master's thesis was with EEG and actually like sequence learning. It was okay. kind of more pure, I, I guess, um, I guess more movement. It was actually in dyslexia, which is okay. like this is a yeah. But you know, there's like a, a, a kind of a motor component to dyslexia as well. Mm -hmm. um, but really, through the PhD, it was it was it was uh, 
emotion and movement and really not too much brain or even really muscle, to be honest. It was more behavioral, like what is happening behaviorally? Does emotion kind of prime the system to move? Which again, like that's one of the main theories, but then it's like, well, if it does, how does it do that, right? right. Do we move stronger, uh, less strong? Do we move quicker, slower? And, you know, and and so, you know, it was a really, I mean, it's a cool line of work. Mm -hmm. um, and then I took that in, to Chicago and basically used a similar paradigm, but we did it in the scanner. And then what we started to learn was the areas of the brain that allow you to produce accurate force in the context of emotion, mm -hmm. right? Which then you, you know, in a way that gets more at kind of performance based mm -hmm. stuff, which, uh, you know, I wasn't doing it in athletes or elite performers. I also wasn't doing it in patient population. I was kind of still it was yeah. maybe more basic, not basic but, science. But, but you have to, though. You have, I mean, you, sure, you, you got to figure it yeah, out you, there, right? Yeah. And then um, small steps, yeah. right? And so, so that was, uh, you know, it, it was great because you started to learn how does the kind of normal motor system look when it's got to now not do what it's doing, sort of in the vacuum, and now it's got to do it in these other contexts. Mm -hmm. Which, and this maybe was where you're going, but so. So as I was kind of coming to the end of that project, it was always like, well, what comes next, right? What right. do we do? And, you know, again, you think of different psychiatric disorders where there's an emotional component. And the reality is movement is not high on the priority list of physicians that work with those patients, right? right. Which is completely understandable. Sure. So you uh, at least with at least within I want to I want to maybe challenge that a little bit sure. from their perspective it's not important right? sure and, correct and, and right. that's the that's the right. thing that that gets sometimes really frustrating because you read these studies and go oh wow but because when we understand how important movement is for quality of life sure. for overall global health yeah. for longevity yeah. now all of a sudden it is a big deal and sure. And I, you know, I run into this. I still run into this. I'll, I'll, I'll pick up on something. I was like, this is exactly what I'm looking for. Now let's find their movement variables. Sure. And they won't have them yeah, because sure. that's not their interest. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, but sure. yeah, anyway, please. No, and so it was one of these, um, I guess, a moment where you got to figure out where do you go next, yeah. right? And, um, and in a sense, it was almost, uh, I guess, like a transition to what is a signal uh, that the system gets that changes how we move. And I don't know, I sort of thought, oh, well, pain has an emotional component, blah, blah. It was more what else changes and what's one of the cleanest external signals. Mm -hmm. And then it was pain, right? And, you know, I think with pain, it's one of those things where we've all felt it, mm -hmm. right? So we all feel like we know it. Right. And then we know what it does to us. But I think the reality is that's that there's a lot of different types of pain mm -hmm. uh, that we experience in very different ways. And what we've basically learned over this last 10 years is that kind of acute physical pain has a very different effect on the motor system versus chronic pain, mm -hmm. right? And one is a warning stimulus that it's very good that we have that. And the motor system basically fires up for want of a better word to get ready to move you out of danger or mm -hmm. protect yourself from that danger. Mm -hmm. In chronic pain, it's this, the, it doesn't appear to be that the motor system is on high alert. Yeah. The motor system's almost essentially inhibited for want of a better word, which again, clinically makes sense. Sure. Right? And that's what you see, but, but, you know, understanding um, that there are these differences, understanding then sort of how the, the interaction between the pain and the motor is changing chronically hopefully then gives you clues on how to try and uh, almost, I don't know if reverse is the right word, but almost renormalize it yeah, for want of a better yeah. word, right? So, And so with your work, um, yeah, and this is something I've asked of, of a number of people, because it seems difficult to, to delineate the border between, because oftentimes chronic pain results from repeated acute pain. There is, sure. there is something that's sure. occurring that that's, whether it's the threat of tissue damage or actual tissue damage, recovery from tissue damage, sure. But then something happens and, and the pain doesn't go away even though the damage is taken care of. So, but finding that point seems to be very difficult. Is that anything that you've, that you've begun to tease out or interested in teasing out in your work? Uh, the short answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, you know. We'll the, have to cut the, that part out then. <laughs> <laughs> it, you know, I think part of it, right, is that we've, we, it, the the time course of of this chronicity is really difficult, right? It, right? And it's difficult because experimentally, 
it's it's almost impossible to and i think the assumption probably is that people will that time course will vary as a function mm -hmm. of the initial injury sure. of probably the the psychological um makeup of that individual right sure. you know sure. catastrophizing sure. a whole host of things right so it you know i think it's a this idea of the transition from acute to chronic is is um is hugely important have we dialed into that yet uh I, the answer I, I, is no but but have we uh started to learn how these two systems are different because it would suggest that if the initial sort of acute physical pain um uh understanding what that looks like and then almost understanding at the other end of the continuum somewhere in between the transition occurred and so app carrion's work for instance has kind of looked at this that it there's a shift from the sensory to the more emotional circuits um but you know i think that's where the what the field is trying to do uh, well I mean, that's just the nobel prize work right if you, yeah, if, you, sure. if you can nail that yeah. down you know you know I, I think where i i would i'd make the case that that I think the brain is going to be important for us understanding mm -hmm. how and where that transition occurs. And the reason I say that is that we know that, uh, that, you know, distraction can change pain. A, a host of things can change pain mm -hmm. where it's not uh, often just going to be the kind of the nociceptive input coming in, right? right. That a, a whole bunch of things are going to change. And so, um, you know, I think there are many different measures that can capture this, but I would say that uh, at least I, like to think uh that the brain is going to be central to to these kind of this biomarker basically of yeah, pain so yeah well and that yeah. you know it seems like there are a lot of a lot of people who are are looking at some of those those characteristics or states that that might predispose people sure. to chronic pain and, yeah and sure. so uh, you know all of it pieces together at some point and that's and that's the yeah. beauty of, of you know translational science as well but um yeah the uh, i with the role that the you know chronic pain is is at least from what we understand it seems to be a, a brain thing you know it's if, if that signal is no longer coming in you know and obviously there are there are types of of uh you know neuropathic pains where there sure. is something going on in the periphery that's right. still eliciting a signal but but if that impulse is no longer reaching the brain yet you're experiencing pain well sure there's something that's got to go on there but that's where that's where i think it with what you're doing is is really fascinating because you're looking inside the brain at, at what's active and, and sure. where the part that's got to be frustrating. And I, I kind of want to pivot to, if we can, is, you know, when you're learning about the brain, you know, uh, go back to, to psych 101, right? People say, well, here's this lobe and this is what this lobe sure. does. And, and here's the cerebellum and that's what the cerebellum does. Yeah. The fact of the matter is, is it's not that simple. <laughs> you know, and, and, and even, even when you get down to, to the smaller structures or, or even, you know, circuits and networks, you know, it, it'd be like saying, you know, let's say, uh, you know, my mother was a nurse. She's not, but let's say she is. Sure. And so, uh, you say, yeah, my mom, the nurse, but that same person also obviously raises kids sure. or has raised one at least. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, has all of the interests, you know, so if you, if you use that, that analog with the brain, how often are you running into problems with, oh, well, we thought this was going on here because of this, but it's actually really not that at all. Um, this is active because, you know, pick something. So we ran into this a lot early on as when we were basically reading two different literatures, right? With the, I say we, I mean the lab. Sure. Myself. Uh, but you, part of the issue is the terminology mm -hmm. differs. So, um, so there's really good pain work and it will talk about dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. Right. right? And I'm thinking, okay, well, this is here and I know dorsal anterior cingulate. It turns out the motor people are talking about the kind of rostral cingulate zones and they're studying this and they're, you know, doing virus tracing studies in, in, uh, primate models, basically mapping motor pain guys are mapping pain. And actually it turns out we're using different words for the very similar part <laughs> of the brain. But if you don't have a motor task, you're not going to see that area activate. Right. And right. the motor guys don't have a pain task. And so, so where it, and, and the other part of it too, is just because of the, the level we're looking at in a voxel size, which is like a three by three by three 
millimeter cube, mm -hmm. just because that one voxel is active across both of these doesn't mean that the same neurons within that that voxel are active, right? right? So you can, even if you get activation at that voxel level, we're still it's kind of still a systems level, like macro level mm -hmm. in terms of pure neural circuits. So, so you've got to be really careful in, you know, just because we got two areas of the brain that were active doing two different things, then they can do both things. Um, but it could also be that there are actually different circuits within those. Mm -hmm. But I think it's fair to say that the regions can be active across those two tasks. And that's basically what we learned of this kind of mid cingulate region was active um, for both, we've done the same thing in the cerebellum. There's regions of the cerebellum that are essentially multi-sensory. And mm -hmm. it kind of makes sense that the brain would work that way, right? Sure. Rather than you have these sort of independent pockets of, now you do this, now right. you do that, <laughs> right? right. It's, yeah, um, yeah. S send, send a message over here to say, that, hey, now it's your job to do something correct. where it's not necessarily working that way. Right, I mean, we want these systems to be integrated, right? right? And, I, you know, that's, you know, one of the thoughts now is, is that there is this natural integration that we you know, we learn that when a pain signal comes in, we, we want to avoid or move. And what maybe, you know, one of the things that chronic pain does is it essentially set, not severs, that's maybe a strong word, but it, it interrupts mm. the integration of these different circuits. And, you know, which if that is the case, it becomes, then the question is, how do we get these circuits integrated again, yeah. right? How do you reintroduce them, get them exactly. talking again? Yeah. And we know that just reducing pain intensity is not, it's it can be enough in some uh, some individuals, but in many it's not right. So has any this just popped into my head, and this is um, it's one of those questions that there's a high likelihood that this is a stupid question. <laughs> Welcome <laughs> to science, people. It's like um, there's, <laughs> but, there's, there's no stupid questions, right. just stupid people. Well, <laughs> jury's out on that one too. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but so uh, in, in talking about that, in in there being a disconnect with some of you know, so you have an ascending signal that comes from the periphery, and that uh, that has an effect on on networks or on circuits in the brain, sure. and with chronic pain, that seems to 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 be disjointed. Has anybody looked at trying to reintroduce that response, that neural response by, and, and I guess we, we kind of do this with, <clears throat> excuse me, with, uh, with, with quantitative sensory testing. I mean, you, yeah. you, you are inducing acute pain, yeah. but has anybody tried can, reconditioning with, with acute pain? I'm, I'm not aware. I know uh, again, I should probably be careful. I remember having conversations with Mike Robinson. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's probably like five, six years ago. And and there was this idea that we've basically, you know, it, at least one component of chronic pain. Again, there's obviously a huge range. And, but one idea is that that you uh, that you almost can well, condition, but you basically retrain the system, right, to be able to uh, kind of. You know, the other thing that we see in our data is the attentional system is actually blunted, appears to be blunted in chronic pain as well. So mm -hmm. when this acute stimulus comes in, we have control subjects or pain-free subjects, I should say, and the attentional system fires up, the motor system fires mm -hmm. up. In chronic pain... Their brain is saying, this is something we need to pay attention to. Correct. Yeah. But somebody that's felt pain for months, probably mm -hmm. years... There's, we just don't see that same orienting of attention, the same priming of the motor mm -hmm. system. It's almost like everything is blunted. So the question then is, right, how do you, do you, do you ramp up? Do you the, really, the you really heat? kick do him you, in the shins? Yeah, yeah. or, you know, and I, this is where these kind of thought experiments come in, right? Like mm -hmm. how else can you, uh, could you access this the system, for want of a better word, to sort of re, right. like recalibrate it. I well, guess, and I wonder if, if in in a way that may be uh, some of the beauty in, in movement evoked pain. If you sure. can find something that 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 integrates more of the brain, sure, um, that that may may at least introduce a stimulus that's different than, you know, if if. if for osteoarthritis, obviously in chronic sure. pain, we, we look at osteoarthritis a lot. So you yeah. have you have this pain, and, and, and a fair amount of it is movement evoked pain or sure. or weight bearing pain if yeah. the, you know the joint space is compressed. But by combining those things, if if that's the signal, if 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 I hum at a certain pitch at you for long enough, yeah. you're going to start to blank that out. Sure. 
Yeah. Now, I don't have to change my volume or anything, but if I just move it to a different pitch, all of a sudden it's on your radar again. Sure. And, and, yeah, and yeah. this is – obviously, you're well aware of this, but for people listening, you know, um, right. you know, for anybody that's this listening along, you know, riding in their car right now, um, when's the last time you've, you know, paid any attention to what your butt feels like on the seat right now? Sure. Yeah, and yeah. until I say that, most people are probably going to say no. Yeah, you know, yeah. There's the one weird, weird person out there, but yeah. – um, and so just just changing that that stimulus a little bit, I wonder if that that might be the gateway to uh yeah. to listening something. And, you know, I think part of it's fear too, right? That if if this hurt when I did this, then I'm gonna stop doing this. Mm -hmm. And that then leads to a whole host of other problems. But um yeah, it's it, you know, I think a big a big part of it is and this is where physical therapists come in as well, right? Is how much pain is okay. Right. 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 And you know, the brain is not really designed to say any is okay in initially, right? If it's a new type of sensation. And, but I think that's where good physical therapists will guide a patient through. And if that patient doesn't have fear and sort of trust that physical therapist, mm -hmm. and my guess is we, this is what we're trying to see in the brain, right? That, that before the, before the movements even happen, the changes are already there, right? right. The fear system has already kicked in. Mm -hmm. Um, it's already essentially inhibiting the motor system from doing what it would normally do. And so then by the time we actually study what does the movement look like, the, the it's already primed to do the opposite of right, what you want right. it to do. So so that's, you know, partly the question is how do you get people, uh, you know, and, and yet the cartilage is disappearing, right? Like mm -hmm. it's, and I, I'm not an expert in OA, but, but there is clear peripheral damage right the there issue is. is the pain doesn't necessarily map to that's that's exactly not perfectly to that right yeah that's the the big question mark and i'm i'm looking into to this a little bit right now but just the the disconnect between you know so so we look at at radiographic evidence sure. and and so there are a number of criteria there could be you know bony protrusions or calcifications joint space sure. um you know for those not entirely familiar with how your knee works you have these these two pretty dense pads of cartilage in addition to all the cartilage that coats the end of your bone and and that uh, works in a way to to not only um you know kind of give a shock absorbing system but also to to make it smooth so when your knee moves sure. there you know it glides upon the the articular cartilage that covers the end of the bone when that wears away then you start to get an inflammatory process sure. and, and and the bone breaks down so what you're alluding to is the joint spacing, but that's also one of the things that you can look at when you're looking at, and when I say radiographic evidence, I just mean x-rays of the knee. Sure. Yeah. But you can look at people that are high on the scale that's used to evaluate these things. And a number of them, if you look at, and, and, and studies have done this, they'll, they'll present a, a number of x-rays to a physician or somebody who would diagnose OA and say, yeah. what would you expect this person's pain to be? Sure. Low, medium, or high? And they say, oh, high. Definitely. Yeah, these yeah. are horrible. These are the ugliest knees I've seen in a long time. Yeah. And that doesn't always match up very well. It's not a very good predictor of, of the pain that the person is. And, sure. and then conversely, there are some who, you know, would, if you look at them, they're, they're pretty low on that scale. Like you're at the beginning yeah. of, of OA here. And, and meanwhile, the pain that they report is yeah. astronomical. Sure. So, yeah, so there are, and, but, but that's, what's really interesting is again, it's a snapshot, right? right. So, we don't know what else that person has experienced. Sure. Um, yeah. And and so and it, there, there could be things that are priming the system sure. to make them feel that yeah. way as well. I, you know, I think there's no question it's real, right? Like that's the problem. Right. It's like, oh, well, it's pain in your head if it's the brain. It's like it, it's – Pain's pain. It, pain's pain, right? <laughs> and there are, you know, I, you know, one of the, the, the biggest – you know, the, the questions can be easy and it's hard answering them. And one of them I think is there were – is the weighting of of you ultimately have this experience of pain mm -hmm. and that is it is what it is for that person and it's it's you believe it and it's true the question is what is the weighting yeah. of that and that that to me i think is a question i'll probably be doing this for another well i don't know 20 years and I, we may security. not <laughs> there we go <laughs> but that's you know and i think we're maybe getting closer to that with mm -hmm. the you know, really, it's only been in the last 20 years, at least in the brain, that that we've learned that the emotional systems are actually, you know, and I know it goes back to um, maybe 
prior to that as well. But now that we can image the brain and we can see activation in these kind of limbic effective circuits, mm -hmm. then there's a component to memory, right? There's a component to emotion. Sure. There's these things. And that doesn't just disappear when we're now going to move, right? Mm -hmm. Like this is, so the, it, it's not that it's all in your head, but there are circuits in your head that can make this worse. Yeah. I guess that that's well, how I would. The, and this say. comes up a, a little bit. I think it's worth noting that, that people ask, I was just listening to a podcast the other day, uh, not mine, somebody else's podcast. Sure. Um, but the, the host asked a physician, well, yeah, but you know, are they just being sissies essentially? You right. know, sure. but that actually doesn't matter. And, and sure. so in, in the literature and people may not know this that are listening along, you know, you, if you, if you gradually increase a stimulus on somebody that at some point goes from just being a sensation to being a painful sensation and ask them to report when that changes, this sure. begins to hurt. They're not looking at any kind of gauge or anything. So if you do this repeatedly and they answer pretty much within the same area, yeah. you can tease out the fact that, well, okay, now they're, you know, they're being honest with me. Sure. They're not lying. Yeah, yeah, sure. So there's that. And then beyond that, if, if you can tell that they're not being dishonest in reporting their pain, from that point on, it almost doesn't matter yeah. whether their threshold is low or not. It's why. Sure. Not if, For but sure. why. Right. And then that becomes important because even even people who if and again, you know, I, I mean no insult to anybody by using the term sissy, but if if that's the point, if you have somebody who has a very low pain threshold and low pain tolerance, and man, this hurts and I can't take it, it really doesn't matter why, you know, the the fact that they're in that state, but but they're not alone. Because, sure. we, we, yeah. you know, even in layman, you know, meathead terms, we've got a term for it. Yeah, sure. So that's a population. Well, yeah. Why? And so I think that's really important to to, yeah. to note that that it doesn't matter, you know, so much that if you have a high tolerance or even a high threshold for pain, if if I can, you know, put a put a hot poker on your arm and you don't even say, well, this doesn't even really hurt. That doesn't matter. It's it's the why. Sure. Well, the other part to it, too, is that I I don't really think at least the data hasn't borne out that if you have a low pain threshold for heat pain, mm -hmm. that you have a higher chance of developing chronic pain, right? right? Like these right. two things are not, it, it's more job security. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, you know, I think the other part of it too, is that the, you know, and this is something that we're trying to deal with now with some of the work that we're doing is that pain, at least chronic pain is going to fluctuate right through the day. It's going to depend on act, Activity levels probably it's going mm -hmm. to depend on the level of distraction and so you know what happens is we have people come in the lab and then we ask them what's your pain now and we get all the you know the kind of standard ratings and they're really good but but we really have no idea of what their pain profile looks like across mm -hmm. time and you know one of the reasons is it so this thing how do you capture the brain in chronic pain right right like how right. and you, you can't image the brain for a week but that's maybe one day we can um you kind of wear a baseball cap that can right. see everything. But right now we can't. And so then it's almost the, the what's sort of driven this move and evoke pain paradigm is how can we kind of evoke the pain that you're going to feel in your everyday life when it's typically going to get worse? And at least then we, we get closer to, uh, I guess, what the brain looks like when it's feeling pain rather than, you know, there's a constant two out of ten. Um you know, resting state is another modality, which, which for the listeners, you basically just have somebody sit quietly for 10 minutes. And we can do that with EEG, we can do it with fMRI. Mm -hmm. And that can be really helpful because you see what the brain looks like at rest and does that differ between pain and no pain. But, but at least for us with this kind of movement evoked idea is how do we, um, how do we image the brain when it's doing it, when there's endogenous pain being evoked by a movement that people have to make every right, day. Right, so, that they can't avoid. Yeah. Uh, you know, that, that brings me to a point I wanted to ask you early on, and we got, you know, imagine that, we got sidetracked. <laughs> um, so you focus on EEG, and, well, or at least a lot of your work. And sure, more recently. Yeah, yeah and so uh, I actually wanted to ask about that a little bit as far as different modalities of brain imaging. Sure. And if you would, as you're describing some of the differences and obviously there's a reason why you're you're using the the imaging type that you're using sure. um but just briefly describe them for people that maybe don't even know what fmri is sure. um as an example and and that's something that's been around for a while now um but maybe some of the pros and cons of using this within your work within looking at pain um and and pain and movement sure so 
so functional MRI, uh, and so most people are aware of MRI. Most people probably had an MRI. It could be on the knee. It could be anywhere, right? Uh, so we put uh, individuals in an MRI scanner, and we do what's called functional MRI, which basically means that we are taking measurements uh, of the brain every two and a half seconds. We get one what's called volume of the brain. Mm -hmm. And so we can put people in the scanner and we can we have a heat thermode. And so we can basically heat the skin up mm -hmm. and to the point where it's painful. And we're basically taking pictures of the brain and looking at the a, a signal change in the brain. And so that's basically looking at the the ratio of oxygenated versus deoxygenated blood. Why do you why why oxygenated versus deoxygenated? What does that tell you? It's, well, so it's more that there's magnetic properties that differ mm -hmm. uh, between these two, and so essentially what that can tell us is it gives us an indirect measure of neuronal activity. So okay. we can't directly measure neural activity with fMRI, but we can indirectly measure it. the The big advantages of fMRI are that you can look at subcortical structures. Uh, well, you can basically look everywhere in the brain. Mm -hmm. um, the and, and essentially what you get is activation. So you can look at areas of the brain that are active when a subject is doing X or Y. Okay. okay. Um, the downsides, we already talked about movement, mm -hmm. right? So just to give the listener an idea that in within the scanner, uh, we're basically looking at three by three by three millimeter cube. So imagine the brain is almost like a Rubik's cube. And that's the voxel that you mentioned. And that's the right? voxel, right. And so it's almost like pixels on a TV, right. like it's a resolution. Um, but through, that that one thing when I was early on, pixels and voxels, I mean, people keep bringing up voxels. I'm like, what the heck is a voxel? Yeah, yeah. But it's but it's you know almost like a a, a pixel with volume. It's right. Exactly. It's, a three -dimensional, it's basically a three dimensional yeah. pixel. That's the best yeah. way to look at it. And so you know, as as uh, I just saw, and uh, so we use here in most places the kind of standard is what's called a three T MRI scan. Mm -hmm. uh, I just read an article that. I'm not sure whether it was it was actually a news article. It wasn't a scientific article yet, but they now have an eleven point seven Tesla human scanner, wow. I believe. Which wow. yeah, which is you know, so I think, you know, across time maybe that resolution gets better. Mm -hmm. Part of the issue is the smaller the resolution, the signal is weaker. And so, you know, it's not like, oh, we can go smaller and smaller, but if you can't get the signal, then it's not right. good. Um, but anyway, so fMRI is basically we put people in an MRI scanner, we have them do a task, and we look at how the brain activates. And we can do that across the whole brain mm -hmm. with EEG. And, and so fMRI, um, that really began in humans in the early 90s, mm -hmm. so maybe 30 years or so in. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, in terms of prevalence, you know, you know, that it had to become available with the skill sets, the software, like there's a whole host of things that had to happen. But, you know, I'm sure if you look on PubMed, the number of papers with fMRI in it has to just be off the charts. Sure. Now. But uh, so, you know, the, the, it, it's really nice in the sense that there's well-established analysis approaches, um, you know, statistically um, really nice controls on a whole bunch of things. And it, it's a very well-established method now. EEG, um, so yeah, one of the drawbacks is movement. Mm -hmm. And in all honesty, another drawback is the cost yeah, of, yeah. of running MR, uh, fMRI studies. Um, with EEG, EEG's been around, uh, you know, Hans Berger was kind of the, uh, godfather is the right word, but one right. of the initial guys, right, looking at this alpha rhythm. And in with EEG, we're basically measuring electrical potentials from the scalp. So we put, Essentially, it's a swim cap, but mm -hmm. that has uh, electrodes in it. And so in that sense, we're then directly measuring neuronal activity, mm -hmm. right? But it's neuronal activity that's in the brain that's kind of further away from the electrode where we're recording it from. The, uh, the timing component is important. So with fMRI, it's basically one volume every two and a half seconds. Mm -hmm. So your spatial resolution is you only know what's going on really every two and a half seconds, mm -hmm. okay? With EEG, we it's can... Like, it's like watching somebody move in a, a really stro slow strobe light. Correct. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yep. Um, and which can be fine as long as you design experiments where <laughs> the timing doesn't... Matter. Where you don't need to know what's going on. At Correct. The yeah. And there, there are ways where you can look at reaction. You can you can, you can can get kind of cute with the, the, the way you set paradigms where you, you can get better temporal resolution, but... Mm -hmm. But with EEG, we're going at about a thousand hertz, so okay. about a thousand times a second. Mm -hmm. So you have much, much better temporal resolution. 
But because you're measuring from the scalp, what's going on in, say, the basal ganglia or really the cerebellum uh, or thalamus is much Deeper harder. Structures. To, yeah, because you just you're recording from yeah. basically. Can, can you the brain, can so. you do something with um, how you're recording to to get an idea of depth of the structures? You can triangulate or yeah. So you so there are you know one of the nice things with EEG is that again you know over this last. I need to be careful with with years because maybe it happened before. Ah, that's all right. It, but, we don't you expect know, you to know everything. Yeah, yeah. You know? Um, but there are ways that you can basically run what's called source localization, mm -hmm. um, where you collect EEG and uh, basically look for or get distributions of activity across the scalp. And then you essentially do what's called dipole modeling, where you, you try and find the source of that a pattern of electrical activity, for want of a better word. So, so you can get closer to sort of full brain neuroimaging with EEG, mm -hmm. uh, but again, you you just like everything, you got to be really careful in how much uh, in not overinterpreting what yeah. it is that you get. And so, you know, with our EEG work, we've we have um, gotten uh, activity within kind of singular regions. Mm -hmm. Um, but most of what we see is is kind of at the cortical level, so the premotor cortex, which sits in front of the primary motor cortex. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, again, I think just because you're not getting, say, basal ganglia activity doesn't mean it's not there. That's right, kind of one of right, the issues. Right. But, you know, I, but knowing the limitations of the tool, then, of course, you correct. can apply it. Correct. Perfect. Yeah. But so, yeah, they're the two main functional modalities that we use with MRI you can also do structural mm -hmm. so we've done a lot of diffusion imaging mm -hmm. where you're basically looking at the kind of roadways through the brain mm -hmm. you know that even with chronic pain has been I would I'd say less sensitive to chronic pain um, you know and largely you know it's it's not you know one of the things we've also learned and again working with someone that, that studies movement disorders we look at parkinson's you know you go straight for substantia nigra we know there's cell loss there there's cell death um with chronic pain it's like where do you go right you know what i mean right. like there's there's we know there's networks mm -hmm. but there's not this one place that hey i'm gonna go look here mm -hmm. and i'm gonna get ultra high resolution i'm gonna do everything i can in this one area mm -hmm. and that's going to tell me what's happening you know so i think we this sort of the if we do come up with this biomarker, it's not going to be one magical region. X marks right? the spot. Kind of Correct. Thing. Right. Who knows? Maybe in different uh, types of chronic pain conditions, there are going to be these different mm -hmm. uh, sort of markers for it. But but yeah, right now there's not, you know, there's insulin. We, we have all these kind of mm -hmm. regions that you, you will see when you activate uh, or when somebody's experiencing pain. The one kind of, this is the golden ticket region. I, I think that's, yeah. you know, regardless of what we do, my guess is that won't play out. It's so where do you, works. where do you see, um, and you know, we probably ought to start to wrap things up sure. here. And one thing I, I'd like to ask always is within your field and then in, you know, specifically in, in your subfield, but then yeah. in, in pain research in general, where do you see us heading in the near future? What, with regard to interests, breakthroughs even let's just look five to ten years out even what what do you think is is coming down the road that's or, or that's the most interesting to you I, that's a very broad okay. question yeah, yeah. so yeah you know what i so what's most interesting to me right now is it is this idea of of the um and you know again it's been around for a little while but this this transition from acute to to chronic um what i'm interested in is is having a better temporal resolution of people's pain mm -hmm. that's one thing and basically taking measurements um more it's basically uh, uh ecological momentary assessments mm -hmm. right where it's mm -hmm. not just what was your pain over the last week on right. average but like if we can ping you on your device three times a day for yeah, a, a week or yeah, two weeks. And yeah. uh, Todd Manini is mm -hmm. here at UF. He's, sure. he's been doing this, you know, in a sense, interested in in mobility and aging, but there's a pain component to what he's doing now. And this is something that we're, you know, really interested in as well. And actually embedding that into the studies that we're running. So, so when the patient comes to us for us to take the snapshot of the brain, even if they're moving, we have a almost like a much better workup in yeah, a way of, yeah. of how this how this looks. 
Um, so that's one part, which I think is coming and we're already working on that. Um, to me, I would say one of the most interesting things, well, no, hold on, no, I think it's two parts. What, <laughs> one is the idea of memory. Okay. And, and if you, if in order to transition to chronic pain, you need an intact memory circuit to remember that not only do I feel pain today, but I felt this yesterday mm. and the day before and the day before and the day before. And so you have this memory component and, you know, there is, there's animal work being done now that suggests that if you're, if you don't have neurogenesis in the hippocampus, then the kind of development to chronic pain is either delayed or doesn't occur. Mm. Again, whether this, you know, in humans, you can't knock out the hippocampus, right? But, <laughs> right? but again, what it's doing is saying that pain is not just the sensory stimulus coming in mm -hmm. repeatedly, mm -hmm. uh, which could originate it, but there has to be something else, right? And that other part is, I think, memory, that there's an emotional component to mm -hmm. each time you feel this. And so I, yeah, that's where, at least that's where my brain is going is, is how do we get at this, you know, because because memory is really not targeted directly for patients with pain, right? Like, right. And it may be indirectly in a sense with a PT, you're trying to get, again, with kind of musculoskeletal pain, you're trying to get people moving. What you're trying to do is have you make this movement that once caused this pain or currently caused this pain, mm -hmm. and we want to get you to move where it doesn't. And mm -hmm. part of that is probably removing almost the memory component or right. overcoming the fear of that, right? Well, so, and, and that's, I had mentioned in our conversation earlier that, that I do some work with Adam Woods's lab yeah. and their, their main focus is mild cognitive impairment, sure. dementia, yeah. Alzheimer's. And so yeah. it's, it's quite the opposite where they're, they're focused on that. And, yep. and I'm in a position where I can say, well, yeah, but can you also look at these individuals sure. and see how, you know, these, yeah, yeah. these pain measures, uh, yeah. Develop. Sure. So yeah, that's, that's really interesting yeah. stuff. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, I think the other big part is if we can learn uh, the, almost these different phenotypes, right. But, but that we can map that to brain, mm -hmm. then you can potentially start to map uh, or, or couple the intervention with the type of pain. Right. 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 And I, again, I know this is what physicians are trying to do, but if we can give them the sort of almost biologically based measures to do this, then mm -hmm. I, you know, I think the other big part of it as well is you can then help to explain to the patient themselves why their pain may vary or right. why it may be feels the way it does feel is, you know, you can talk about activation within certain circuits mm -hmm. in the brain and that then opens up other avenues of things that we can then mm -hmm. uh, use to hopefully try and treat that patient. Well, and, so, and even if it comes down to something as simple as healthy coping strategies you sure. know, throughout their day. Yeah, you know, for so. sure. Yeah. yeah um, that's great. So we'll see. I mean, yeah. there's definitely enough to well, keep th this Thank you so much for uh, what I think was a fantastic conversation. Yeah, this, was is, fun. this is one of those where we could turn this into a three-hour podcast very easily sure, if we didn't both have things to do. <laughs> right. And I don't know if people would want to hear me talk for that long. But, well, but this, anyway, is, it was this is the beauty. What we can do is we can give them a rest. I'll have a few other people come on, and then maybe we'll talk to you again in the spring. I'd be happy see to come back. That'd be great. Thank you awesome. so much. Do, uh, do you have a web page for your lab that people can? Uh... Yeah. Uh, it's LRN Lab. So Laboratory for Rehabilitation Neuroscience. So lrnlab.org. All right. Great. And, uh, yeah. and uh, I'm sure Kat, by the time we release this, we'll have that right up on the screen underneath you as you Great. say it. Perfect. All right. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thanks. Thank you for joining this episode of The Price of Pain. Opinions expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host and guests and not representative of the University of Florida or parent institutions of our guests, unless specifically stated. You can find more information about Price on the World Wide Web at price.ctsi.ufl.edu. And keep up with our researchers on social media by searching Facebook for UF Price, by following at UF underscore pain on Twitter, and Price of Pain podcast, all one word, on Instagram. <laughs>